Hello and welcome to today's event, Digital Signatures for Local Government, a must-have app in every department. This is Bob Feingold, Senior Fellow for the Center for Digital Government. I'm a retired Air Force officer who's been in uh, IT his entire career and a former CIO for the state of Colorado. I'm excited to serve as your monitor for today's event and just want to say thank you for joining us. I know we're in for an informative session over the next 60 minutes. But before we begin, a couple of housekeeping notes. A recording of this presentation will be emailed to all registrants within 48 hours. You can use the recording for your reference or feel free to pass it along to colleagues. Also, you should see a Q&A box on the bottom left of the presentation panel. Please send in any questions as they come up throughout the presentation. Our speakers will address as many of these questions as we can during the Q&A portion at the close of the webinar. From the, from the experience of the Center for Digital Government, we are seeing more and more states and local jurisdictions taking an active interest in digital signature technology. These groups are looking for cost savings as well as ways to accelerate their interactions with citizens. This webinar is being brought to you by the Center for Digital Go Government, a branch of eRepublic. The center is a national thought leader in digital government with many interesting publications based upon its in-depth research on IT policies and best practices for state and local government. Today we want to cover these agenda items. The two speakers today will provide factual experience that we believe will be most useful to you. They will, in the course of their presentation, discuss ways to continue their efforts despite harsh financial times and attempts to maintain high service levels. We will then address your questions and hopefully have time to summarize. Now I'd like to introduce the speakers for today. First, Mauricio Pinto is the local government market manager at ARX. He began his career as a CPA at Coopers and Libran, worked as a financial controller for over 10 years, and for the last 13 years has focused on sales and marketing of software applications. He has written several white papers on using technology to increase efficiency in organizations. He has been interviewed for numerous articles for such publications as Integrated Solutions Magazine, Radiology Today, For the Record, Advance for Healthcare Information Executives, and Digital Publishing Solutions. Mario, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Bob. Hello, everyone. I manage state and local government for ARX, and my job today is to discuss how digital signatures are helping government organizations do more with less, practically um, a necessity in today's economic climate. Today I'll um, discuss how, um, uh, how digital signatures can help any government agency um, today, why you might need it, why your peers are using it. I'll talk about the technology, including how digital signatures differ from electronic signatures. I'll show you what the actual signing process looks like. I'll say a very few words about ARX, and then I want to turn it over to our guest speaker from Kane County. Working with state and local government on a daily basis, I truly believe that digital signatures is, as Bob said, a must-have 
application in order to deliver the quality of service that is expected of you folks today. Digital signatures uh, allow you to increase efficiency and productivity by eliminating paper and the surrounding process that comes with paper, the handling, the routing, the, uh, the overall filing process. So you cannot help but be more productive. All of the information that is needed for transparency and auditability is embedded directly into the signed document. And without digital signatures, your investment in document or content management or even a workflow system will hit a virtual roadblock when it comes to approvals and signatures. Without digital signatures, you'd have to print, sign, scan, uh, refile, or archive the, the document. With digital signatures, the entire process can remain truly paperless. One of the things we'll discuss is that there are different types of electronic signatures. So selecting an application that is based on national and even international standards becomes best practice for a government organization. You'll want to avoid having to use different solutions in different departments. So a single application that can meet the requirements of all of your departments should be the goal. You should be able to start small and scale up as needed. You'll want to reduce both the hard costs and the soft costs associated with manual and paper processes. And ultimately, you'll want to demonstrate a quick return on investment. If you're not familiar with AIM, uh, it's a nonprofit information management research and resource organization that has published a survey on digital signatures for document workflow and SharePoint specifically. You can find the complete uh, white paper at their website, uh, but I am incorporating here into my presentation four other findings. When asked about the biggest benefits of digital signature solutions, the response was speeding up of approval processes and time savings. When asked what percentage of documents or processes require a signature, the majority of the respondents said that more than 50% of the documents require one. When asked what percentage of documents are printed just for the purpose of obtaining a signature, most respondents said that more than half of their documents are printed for that reason, and 20% of the respondents said that that is the primary reason to print a document. And one more conclusion to share with you. When asked, uh, when we asked organizations that were planning to use or are using SharePoint, uh, whether they looked for digital signatures as part of the requirements, fully 43% want to incorporate digital signatures into their workflow process. So where specifically do our customers use digital signatures? The answer is that eventually everywhere, but they do come to us typically with a particular departmental requirement or need in mind. Our customers use COSIGN to process the documentation in their court systems, in their legal departments. They use them to approve purchase orders. Uh, engineers need to have their diagrams and their change orders reviewed and approved. Finance needs to have each step of the fulfillment process approved. When you think about all the forms that an employee fills out during the onboarding process, that's an ideal spot for digital signatures, as well as all the forms that we fill out on a daily basis, timesheets and expense reports and travel approval requests. And interestingly, we receive a lot of inquiries for what we call point of service scenarios, where you're dealing with the public and you need to capture their signature and then securely seal the document with a digital signature. Now, the, the best way to understand digital signature technology is to begin with what the law says. There is legislation for states called UITA. There is federal legislation known as eSign, both of which have the objective of promoting electronic commerce, and both of which make electronic signatures legal and valid. They leave the specific choice of technology up to the user 
And unfortunately, this can include a lot of things, including everything from pressing a button on a website to embedding an image of your signature into a document to the most sophisticated technology, which happens to be digital signatures. The bottom line from your perspective is that the only type of electronic signature that can guarantee the identity of the signer, the intent to sign, and the integrity of the signed information is digital signature. It's also known as PKI or public key infrastructure. With this technology, each signer is issued a unique signing certificate. Before you sign, you're required to authenticate your identity. The system will embed the information from your unique certificate directly into each and every signed document so that then you can send that document to anyone, anywhere, and they'll be able to validate who signed and that nothing has changed. So if you're going to go down the path of digital signatures or PKI-based signatures, why would you look at cosine? Um, a traditional deployment of digital signatures is cumbersome. You would normally have to deploy the signer certificates to each user's PC or on something that they would carry, uh, a token or a smart card. What makes cosine so different and so attractive to our customers is that all of the sensitive signing components the certificates, the signing keys, even the graphical signatures are all stored and managed on a pre-configured black box network device. We even offer uh, an appliance that has been certified by the Department of Defense. This is known as a FIPS appliance, and it happens to be what Kane County uses and we'll probably mention. The appliance is shipped to the customer. We set up a web session just like this one. We guide you through the installation, which takes all of about 90 minutes. The second key difference for Cosine is that the appliance comes with out-of-the-box integration to Active Directory and several other user directories. So for example, a security group for signers is created in Active Directory. Anyone in that group is automatically enrolled as a signer in the cosign appliance. When you don't want somebody to sign anymore, you simply remove them from the security group. So the key differentiators for cosign are the simple to implement uh, approach to the appliance and the simple to manage process for the users. A third differentiator I actually already alluded to the certificate information is embedded into each and every signed document, which means a couple of things. One is that the reviewer doesn't need to be connected to any third-party website or even to the internet. They'll be able to validate the document completely as a stand-alone process. This also means that you're not locked into a particular PKI vendor. If for whatever reason, ARX disappeared tomorrow, the millions of documents that have been signed by our customers will continue to be validatable for the life of the document. And finally, Cosign provides some rich end user functionality around the actual signing process. You can include, for example, a graphical signature. You can include reason codes, titles, logos, date and timestamps. You can move and modify the signature field itself. And with office documents, you can tie signature fields to particular sections of the document, which is practically necessary for documents like expense reports or travel requests, where one person will fill out one portion of the document, and somebody else may add a comment and then approve the document separately. Cosign lets you sign more applications than any other solution. And just in case, we provide a feature that lets you sign any printable output. So for example, you may have purchase orders generated by an ERP system or financial reports coming out of your uh, accounting system. By printing to Cosign, the result is a signed PDF, which you can then, of course, route electronically. Alternatively, we provide with the product an easy-to-use toolkit called SAPI or Signature API, 
that lets you perform web signing, batch signing, and it lets you customize your own applications. And Kane County, again, is making use of this product as well. The last point I want to make about our product uh, refers to our integration with SharePoint. It's important to note that with the core co-sign solution, you can sign both inside and outside of SharePoint. The integration is already there. But we do offer two advanced modules. The SharePoint add-on lets you sign across the web and even from a mobile device like your phone. We also offer a Nintex integration add-on, which lets you make use of the graphical workflow designer that comes with Nintex to easily incorporate digital signatures into your workflow. On our website, we have a lot of videos. You can see how to sign different types of documents, even by industry. But I did want to provide a feel for that signing process. All of the speakers today are working with uh, a single slide deck here. So all I've got for you is screenshots of a document I signed last week. But again, just to give you an idea, there's a signing icon at the very top. And when you click on that, you are able to create anywhere on the document, any size you want, a signature field. You are then presented with the ability to select a uh, graphical signature, a uh, reason code, a title. When it comes to graphical signatures, the reason we provide you the ability to have multiple signatures is that you may want to sign with your full signature. You may want to sign with your initials. We have engineers that sign with their engineering stamp or stamps. We have counties that sign with their official county seal. So these are all options. Uh, for the end user and for the signing process. When it comes time to authenticate who you are, again, you have choices. You can use a simple password. You can use your Active Directory credentials. You can use what's called one-time password and radius authentication, which is something that King County uses. You can use separate tokens. And we even provide support for a fingerprint biometric device if you have need or desire for any of these advanced authentication methods. The signature itself is embedded into the document. And once you save it and then send it to anybody else, they will be able to independently use the features, the native features of Microsoft, or in this case, Adobe, to recognize that the document has been digitally signed. They'll be able to prove the, what we refer to as the three I's, the identity of the signer, the intent to sign, and the integrity of the signed information. Now, there's a lot of information about ARX, the company, on our website as well. Really, the only thing I want to say about ARX today is best summed up by Forrester Research. They have said ARX is unique, and it provides a way to easily add digital signature functionality to your existing process. I encourage you to come to our website and check us out. Bob? Thank you, uh, Mauricio. That, that was great. Um, if any of our participants have uh, questions, please feel free to uh, uh, type them in uh, as we go. And um, now I would uh, like to tell you something about our next speaker, Josh Orr from Kane County, Illinois. Uh, Josh is the solution architect and mid-tier developer for the Kane County, Illinois Circuit Clerk's Office. Over his 12-year career in the information system field, Josh has dedicated his, his efforts to bring the best of web technologies to the court system. As a member of the development team for Kane County, Josh has been recognized as a CIO 100 award winner for his work on the Order of Protection project. Uh, Josh, take it away. Hi, thanks, Bob. 
Again, my name is Josh Orr, and I'm the Cir Solutions Architect for the Kane County Circuit Clerk's Office. Today I'm going to tell you about our digital signature implementation and specifically how we use Cosign Central with our electronic courtroom initiative. For the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about who we I'm going to talk about who we are, what we had before the electronic courtroom project in the way of courtroom electronics, where we wanted to go, how we wanted the project to take shape, what kind of roadblocks we faced to bringing up an electronic courtroom, and how we address them. Kane County, Illinois is what's referred to as one of the collar counties of Chicago. We're about one hour due west. Um, there's about half a million inhabitants in Kane County spread along three major population centers up and down the Fox River. So we're kind of a long county from end to end, which, which poses some interesting challenges. The circuit clerk's office is the keep, official keeper of the court record. We keep both the paper and electronic court records. We maintain a mandatory presence at all court proceedings. We have many state and state law enforcement reporting duties, and we also collect various monies for fines, filing fees, uh, restitution monies, and whatnot. When we're conducting these electronic courtroom projects, we're also heavily involved with three other major groups, the judiciary, the judges, the state's attorney's office, and the public, whether they be private bar members or pro se defendants. There's other organizations that we also integrate with, but those are the major ones. Before we started the electronic courtroom initiative, way back in 2002, we decided to bring up an electronic bond call process. The reason we wanted to do so was simply that our jail, where the prisoners were kept, was in a different physical location than the courthouse, and transporting the documents over wasn't very uh, Transporting the prisoners from one location to another was definitely expensive, and we also didn't want to get into the business of having to courier over documents because that slows down the sheriffs and their processing. As, a, as other benefits that we were looking for out of this process, was we were looking for some more uh, legible documents, and we, this was a good opportunity to sort of test the waters with getting electronics directly into the hands of judges and sheriffs and lawyers and whatnot. So like I said, this was back in 2002, so the technology of the time was a little bit more limiting, and we also had to bring this process up quickly. I believe it was about three months from inception to implementation. So at the time, we decided we were going to use an electronic signature pad, very similar to what you'd find in any grocery store or whatnot, just standard uh, stylus and touchpad. The great thing about using that was it was easy. A USB device, you plug it in, you make some configurations, easy to use. It's friendly adoption. Everybody's used them in the grocery stores and whatnot, so it wasn't this alien technology we were putting in the hands of judges. And we weren't really breaking any conventions either. We weren't breaking much ground. It was, you know, the, the signature was ending up on paper via pixels rather than with ink. So a little bit, a little bit of a change, but not a whole lot. Now, the downsides to using a signature pad are it required some dedicated hardware. You still had to go out and actually buy a signature pad. There was some software that needed to be configured per device, which gets a little bit cumbersome. And then it's not very portable. I mean, you can drag around a laptop with a signature pad hung off of it, but nobody, nobody really wants to do that. Now, shortly after this, around 2005, 2006, we implemented our electronic order of protection process. Very similar in that we were pushing documents from point to point, but this time it was a bit more sophisticated. For one, we brought in the Adobe Lifecycle product in order to route these forms a bit more efficiently. There were a lot more players involved in this one. There's various um, various advocacy groups involved, uh, some uh, low-cost attorneys and whatnot, so there was a lot more people who we had to accommodate for this process. But there was also a lot more bang for the buck. Instead of just helping out, you know, helping the sheriff process prisoners a little bit faster, 
we're helping out people avoid domestic violence situations, which I can say is incredibly more rewarding. Now, we also at this time, we uh, because we had more users, we had to get a little bit more creative with our with our hardware. So we ended up doing things like using the earliest tablet PCs and whatnot to get around the question of the portability of the signature pad. So that brings us to what we wanted. What we wanted was a, as near to a paperless courtroom as we could get. We can't go completely paperless because of statutory reasons, and it's just and it is cumbersome. But we wanted to get as close as possible. In order to do this, we had to we had to come up with a method of moving documents around in a courtroom that's very very quick. Some of these courtrooms can see 300 people in the morning, if not more. And that's just the people who show up. We still need to process files for the people who don't. So it, the technology had to be very fast. And we also wanted something that could sign multiple documents at once because of the people who don't show up, so we could do bulk orders and whatnot. The other thing, the other requirement that we wanted for this was we wanted it to use web technology. Being a small shop, we have a hard time keeping software distribution going if we had repetitive updates that we had to install on each of us. So our solution had to be something we could deploy over the web, over our intranet. Another capability that we wanted to provide alongside of the electronic courtroom was we wanted to address the eventuality of mobile signing. Most of our judges would like to be able to uh, sign process documents, such as search warrants and whatnot, from any location that's possible, and we're currently working towards that. And so that's something we kept in mind as we were developing a solution for the electronic court application. And we also wanted this solution to be device agnostic. At the time we were talking about we wanted it to work on any laptop that we had put in front of the judge, but now we're talking about a whole realm of different devices, smartphones, tablets, laptops still. So we wanted our solutions had to be fairly flexible. The other thing is we wanted to get out in front of the standard. Eventually, there, eventually we foresee a tightening of digital signature regulations, and we didn't want to be on the wrong side of that. So we chose to go with the best. We went with PKI for all the reasons that Mauricio talked about and a whole lot of scientific reasons. It's simply the best signature technology out there. So what kind of roadblocks did we face? Well, the most major thing we faced is the tradition and culture of the court system. The courts essentially have operated with judges' signatures being the final authority, an ink signature on a piece of paper for hundreds of years, and we wanted to change that fairly fundamentally. Well, you know, and then we have to we also have to keep in mind that the public, in order to trust the document, wants to actually see a judge's signature, not just something typed out saying that a judge intended to sign it. There were various security concerns. The judges very much value their signatures and want to make sure that they're guarded to every extent possible. And beyond just securing this signature, we also have to secure secure the signature from internal employees so no single person has authority to use a judge's signature without the judge's intent. Now we looked at various hardware device solutions such as uh, hardware tokens, smart cards, all kinds of stuff like that, but they're not very friendly. They Once you start talking about issuing out you know, a bunch of different hardware devices, the cost starts adding up very quickly. And a hardware solution requ often requires some pretty serious changes to your network infrastructure. Our other, the last roadblock we faced was we wanted to implement PKI, but PKI is considered difficult. And difficult is usually equated with expensive, and people don't want to address difficult, expensive problems, if at all possible. So the reason why we chose Cosign to help us out on this they took away the roadblocks. We off the Cosign product allows us to bundle in a graphical signature along with the digital certificate. So we are 
we are meshing with the culture of the court system and providing the signature that both the judges and the public want to see. Security. The, the appliance that we receive from ARX, the Cosine Central Appliance, is a tamper-proof FIPS storage device that things bomb-proof. Very, very secure. It allows for a centralized management of certificates, so we don't have to worry about somebody having a key hanging out on their machine somewhere or what kind of server do we put these on or what kind of product. It's all managed for us. We don't have to think about it. All of the signing occurs on the appliance, which is both secure and convenient because that's the problem that I didn't have to solve with middle tier application code. I simply called the API, sent the document off to the appliance, and it came back signed. And radius authentication. We used one of our concerns that I mentioned before was that no single person have access to the judge's, the judge's signatures. So we used the radius product to split authority. Our IT department down the street manages the active directory and we manage the radius authentication so there's no single god mode admin who can do anything without the user requesting a change. We also, using radius authentication also provides us with the option of bringing in smart cards and uh, biometrics in the future if we so choose. The other, the other main reason why we chose the, the Cosine Central Appliance was a signature API. It gave us a simplified web programming model. I'd be happy to get into this with anybody who has specific questions, but I don't want to bore anybody with the developer's details here. So where are we now? We have our electronic courtroom in place. It's in about five courtrooms right now, and we have our ion expansion. We're, we're beginning to migrate our electronic signature process users over to digital signatures. We found that you can just slide in, you can unplug the signature pad, slide in the ARX software, and now and get the people configured on it. And now anybody who is using the signature pad can simply authenticate using uh, their Active Directory credentials as well as their Radius password, and it simplifies the signing process for them. We're prepared for any standard. We went right to the top, so we don't have to worry a whole lot about it. We're going to be piloting a remote signing project where we can have users sign documents off-site if need be. We're in the middle of some technical implementation on that. We have had it done in the past, but we wanna, we're working on our internal processes to deliver a good, a good experience to the end user. And we've had pretty excellent user adoption. A lot of our judges like the software and the they like the ability to sign without the signature pad. Signature pads are kind of cumbersome, so any of the users who end up using it tend to like it so and want to, want to take it with them when they rotate to another courtroom. So I want to thank you all for your time this afternoon, and I believe now we're going to open up for the question and answer session. Thank you, Josh. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Go to the next slide. Pardon the delay. Uh, this this slide shows the contact information for our presenters. So if, if you like, please uh, take a moment uh, to take a note. Give you some time to do that. Okay, since we're getting close to uh, the end of our time, let's uh, jump to the questions. Uh, many of you have been asking about getting copies of today's presentation. Within the next 48 hours, Governing will provide all attendees with a link to the recording 
for your reference or to share with colleagues. Uh, so, so let's go to the questions. And I'm going to get to the first ones here. Um, the first question uh, will be for uh, Mauricio. Uh, can cosine sign FileMaker profiles? Sorry, Bob. Mauricio? Can you repeat that? Can can cosine sign what? FileMaker Pro files. Ah, got it, guys. Um, so the way to think about digital signatures is that at the end of the day, there's two application vendors that natively support digital signatures. So that's Microsoft and Adobe, and it's a bit of a hard stop. So ultimately, you want to you want to end up with one of their formats. Uh, if it's a different application, then we can make use of one of the two options that I talked about in my presentation. You can print to cosine. Regardless of the starting format, you print to cosine, the end result will be a signed PDF. So the short answer to that question is you would make use of our print to cosine functionality to sign uh, FileMaker Pro document. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, here's a question for Josh. Uh, what software is used in terms of workflow, that is, da the daily document process for the court, and does Cosign integrate well with it? The daily, the daily process that actually occurs in the fast acting courtrooms is an in-house written piece of custom software, but most of the interactions with ARX occur through calls to the Adobe Lifecycle. We wrote a little Flex app that fires information at the Lifecycle box, gets a PDF back, fires it at cosine, gets it signed. So it's it's kind of a mesh between in-house and Adobe Lifecycle. Thank you very much. Uh, again, for Mauricio, um, Arthur's asking, what about redundancy for the FIPS storage device. Thank you, Bob. So a, a user has several options. Obviously, they can go with a single device, which you will back up regularly as per your own internal procedures. You can back up as often as you want to whatever media that you want. The result is an encrypted file. So if you only go with one device, uh, then obviously the appliance is covered by your uh, maintenance and support agreement, you would be down for the time that it takes to get you a replacement appliance, and then we would uh, restore from the encrypted backup. Um, the preferred option is to also purchase a second backup device, which you can install in either cold or hot backup mode. Thank you. Uh, now I have a question for uh, Josh from Kerry. Uh, have other counties or courts been interested to see what you have done? Yes, we have actually had another local court, um, another Collar County, approach us and see what we've done. The word's starting to get out now, so I imagine we'll see more interest in the future. Uh, the, the electronic courtroom has only been in place for about a year now, during which there was a lot of development going on. But yes, we are seeing some interest now. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, again, Mauricio, uh, how long does it take to assign a new person a signature account? Uh, it's as quick as the Active Directory Administrator can add them to the group, the security group. Uh, the default synchronization between the cosine appliance and Active Directory is every 40 seconds, and you folks can adjust it up or down based on your own preferences. So as soon as the synchronization occurs, the appliance will generate a certificate and the signing keys for that signer, and they're immediately able to sign. Um, they can then upload an image of their graphical signature, or more ideally, they march through a central location. You capture it once, and their graphical signature is uploaded to their profile in the cosine appliance. Can I speak Very good. to, can I speak yeah, to that one also right quick? Yeah, I actually had an issue where we had to emergency add a judge that was going to be using it the same day, and we had them, including graphical, signature, radius, config, everything done in under five minutes. Oh, that's very good. 
Uh, this is a, a related question for Mauricio from Klaus. How would Cosign handle signatures from non-active directory persons or from the general public? Um, electronic yeah. signature pads? Um, that's a great question, Bob. So the way to think about Cosign is that it basically converts the customer into their own certificate authority. Right? It creates a root certificate for the organization. It's able to create the individual certificates for anybody the organization designates as a signer. Uh, technically, the appliance doesn't care if it's an internal signer or an external signer. The key question here is that a single appliance cannot be implemented in both active directory mode, which is the typical preferred approach for internal signers, and directory independent mode, which means using the built-in directory for external signers. So um, you would either have to go all active directory or all non-active directory, or you would have to purchase two different appliances, one for internal signers, in Active Directory mode, and another for external signers in Directory Independent mode. OK, uh, thank you, Mauricio. Here's, here's another question from Dave, um, taking that maybe a little further. What is the licensing structure, and what is the cost? And um, I'm assuming that's for Mauricio, right? Thank you, Bob. Yes. Uh, so the, the the cost is fairly straightforward for cosine. You're always going to need the cosine appliance. Obviously, that's the heart of the solution. And um, if you're talking about a non-Department of Defense certified appliance, you're talking about a flat $9,000 for the appliance. And then you're buying licenses based on volume. They start at 140 apiece. Uh, at the 200 level, they drop to half that price, and of course, it continues on based on volume. So you will always need the appliance, you will always need the licenses, and then whatever your subtotal is, there's going to be a 20% annual support and maintenance to obviously warrant the appliance itself and provide for technical support and upgrades. Okay. Thank you, Mauricio. Now, just to make sure we, uh, we're, we're covering all the questions. I want to ask uh, uh, forward a question from James. Um, does this require purchase of the network appliance plus certificates from a certificate authority for each signer? Uh, no, it doesn't, and that's also a very good question. As I mentioned earlier, um, the, the cosign approach makes the organization their own certificate authority. Having said that, if there is a need or a desire to, to use a third-party certificate authority or your own already existing um, CA, as they're referred to, um, Cosign can accommodate that as well. OK. Uh, Josh, uh, Ozzy wants to know, how many users do you currently have using the system in Kane County? As far as signing users, we have 20 registered judges, I believe, or as, as close to the number. Any given moment, concurrently signing users, somewhere around 10. However, the, the courtroom software also encompasses all the other non-signing parties. I think I sat down and counted it out. We've got about 60 to 70 people actively using it at the time. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, James is uh, asking a question that uh, might require inputs from both of our speakers, uh, just to make sure that we cover it uh, completely. Um, uh, the, I'll ask Mauricio to respond first. Uh, the question is, are there any municipalities using this, the digital signatures, municipalities using the digital signatures? Um, we do, uh, folks. So we, we have all levels of government using uh, the product, and, and a lot of these are on our website if, uh, if you poke around by, um, by industry category. Uh, but we have uh, a lot of recognizable federal organizations, state organizations, state agencies, um, counties, and cities using the product. And again, um, we, we do list uh, those that we can on the website themselves. Okay, Josh, do you have 
uh, perhaps something to add? There, are, I'm scant on the details of how many counties or whatnot, but I do know that there are other counties in Illinois that are moving towards digital signatures. Not all of them are looking ARX. Not most of them are still in the discovery phase, but it is something that, if not implemented, is widely talked about. I can't speak okay. to municipalities, though. I, I work mostly with counties. Okay, very good. Thank you both. Um, here's a question from Kim, and I'm going to uh, ask Mauricio to answer this one. Uh, would the validity or authentication of a signature be compromised if cosign were to no longer be in business at any time in the future? Yeah, thank you, Bob. Uh, so, no, the, the answer is no. At any point in time, uh, you folks can choose to stop using cosign. Um, the, the, the real question here is what happens to all of the documents that have been signed with the cosign solution? And just like with a wet ink signature, those signatures continue to be valid and validatable for the life of the document. So there is zero impact on a customer moving away from ARX or moving away from the cosign solution. Yeah, I'd like to, what I, what I can say about that too is that the document, in order to make a document able to be validated, all you have, into perpetuity, all you have to do is export your root certificate, um, the public root public key off the device, and you can use that to validate a document and the appliance can go away as long as you have that root, root cert file saved somewhere. Thank you both. Uh, here's a question from, uh, from Kevin. And um, Mauricio, uh, if you wouldn't mind giving this one a try. Uh, is the root certificate authority that you set up trusted externally so when users on the internet open a document they will see that it is trusted. Thank you, Bob. Um, so, folks, uh, partly what I, I suspect the um, the audience member is asking is, you know, is there such a thing as a uh, true worldwide verifiable certificate? And the answer is no. Uh, unfortunately, because of the um, the uh, adversarial position, we could say, between Microsoft and Adobe. So there are certificates that are automatically recognized by Microsoft, but they will not be recognized by Adobe documents. There are certificates that are automatically recognized by Adobe that are not automatically recognized by uh, Microsoft. So if you're going with the solution out of the box with cosign, what we provide is an executable that you would send to anybody you're sharing documents with outside of the organization. Um, that executable one time will add the root certificate of the signing organization and make it validatable by both Microsoft and Adobe. So it's actually a more effective uh, way to handle the validation than attempting to use something that is automatically validated by one or the other. Okay. Um, here's a question from Ozzy for uh, Mauricio. What concerns have potential customers had with essentially being their own certificate authority? I assume many government entities might not feel comfortable with assuming this responsibility. Mauricio? Uh, yeah, thank you, Bob. I, I, folks, I think you'll actually find the opposite. Um, in the same way that you folks manage your own email domains, there is uh, absolutely zero reason why you can't manage your own certificate authority, authority domain. At the end of the day, you folks are doing better identity proofing of your signers as employees than any third party is going to ever do. Um, the, the other important way to look at this is that the product has been vetted and is being used at all manner of um, federal levels, um, court systems, Department of Homeland Security, 
Um, I think, again, if you look through our website and look at the customers that we have, uh, you're not breaking new ground here. The, uh, the usability, the acceptability of the product has been fully established. Okay, thank you. Again, for Mauricio, I've got a question from Jack. He says, so if I want to implement for internal and external users, do I really need a separate license for each public user that signs? Thanks, Bob. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, Jack. Um, we, we do offer a couple of approaches to the licensing model, however. Uh, in other words, for internal purposes, it does make sense to go with an unlimited use named user model, named license model. Um, but we do offer uh, alternative uh, licensing. For example, if you have external signers that are coming in and signing infrequently, perhaps only signing one time. So we can accommodate that through what we call an annual signature capacity model, where instead you're buying for external signers um, X amount of signatures per year. And um, you know, so for example, if you bought 10,000 signatures per year for use by these external signers, that might be 10,000 people signing one time. So again, when, when you reach out to us, we can run through the various options. But the goal here is to accommodate not only all the different types of signers that you have, uh, but the different types of signing that uh, you'll want to do in your organization. Hey, thank you very much, Mauricio and Jack. Um, I have a couple of questions that have come in for Josh. Uh, let me go through them. So, Josh, if, if you are using Adobe Lifecycle, why didn't you use the built-in Adobe signing capability? The Adobe built-in signing capability, basically you had to unlock the user certificate. So what it did without getting too deep into the details was it essentially turned on God mode for the lifecycle admin. They, the administrator could reset accounts, could potentially reset accounts and sign documents using, using the, the certificate. It essentially didn't allow us a means of separating the powers, such as what we were able to do by splitting the Active Directory and the radius. And Bob, if I can add to that, the, the other important thing is that even as uh, Microsoft and Adobe start incorporating some signing functionality into their very good products, uh, the fact of the matter is that the, the primary objection to PKI-based signing is the management of the certificates. So at the end of the day, the Cosign Appliance gives IT centralized management of uh, the certificate, centralized management of the users, and then, on top of that, you may be looking for some signing functionality which comes with the product. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, we have a question from George for Josh. Uh, is Kane County considering applications for cosign in departments outside of the circuit court? There, the word, like I said, the word is just starting to get out. So as the word's getting out, people are interested. We, I wouldn't say anybody is jumping right on it right now, but they're starting to do a bit of research. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's a question for uh, Mauricio from Tom. Can Cosign be used in a public-facing web portal? Yes, thank you, Bob. Uh, so yes, this goes back to something I mentioned earlier. Is, uh, you can use the appliance for both internal and external signers. Uh, a a public-facing web portal falls under that category. Uh, you would want to make use of our signature APIs in order to sign documents on the web portal itself. And that's something that's being used by a lot of our customers. OK. Um, again, Mauricio, here's a question from Mary. Is, is it possible to get Cosign as a SaaS solution? SaaS. Thank you, Mary. Um, the timing is good because uh, a few months ago the answer would have been no. We are in the process of developing a, uh, a solution for digital signature that will be provided on the cloud. 
uh, we're several months away. Uh, I think you can look for that in the Q3 time frame. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, for for Josh, um, how did how did you get the, the budget approved? Uh, how did you uh, make the case? Well, it came as part of the larger project. It wasn't it wasn't that anybody said, okay, we want a digital digital signature solution, go out and find it, or that I went to them and said, we need this. It was basically how do we how do we move documents in the courtroom, and the the stop was always getting them signed without having to print them out and sign them. So we did a we did a little bit of research, found a solution to the problem, and then I went to the project budget for that. Okay. Well, here's a follow-on question that, that just came in. Um, did you do an ROI analysis? After implementation, if so, how long did it take to reach break even? We haven't yet done a formal ROI study on it. That's just not something we've done yet. We, I imagine we will in the future. However, I can say we have done some am analysis of work that it saved, and it saved us about 100,000 manual docket entries onto the system, as well as uh, thousands of uh, form scans to scan the form into our uh, or scan the document into our document management service. So while I can't really speak to ROI, I can say it certainly saved us a lot of work. Well, we have time for uh, one more question that's here, and uh, this one would probably be for Mauricio. Uh, what kind of training is required by end users in order to start using Cosign? Thank you, Bob. Uh, minimal, folks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the appliance can be installed and ready for use uh, within 90 minutes to two hours. Uh, we immediately will schedule some uh, end user training. We take a train the trainer approach. We do it remotely over web session. And basically, it takes the form of how do, um, how do I install my uh, graphical signature? How do I sign an office document? How do I sign a PDF document? How do I uh, play with the various options? So it's very quick. Um, we're talking about uh, a couple of hours at the top. Hey, very good. Well, I want to respect our one-hour commitment, uh, so we'll wrap it up here. In closing, I would just like to thank everyone for joining us for today's event. A big, uh, a big uh, thank you needs to go to our featured presenters, uh, Mauricio Pinto and Josh Orr, and a special thanks to our partners at ARX for enabling us to bring this worthwhile discussion to our audience. Uh, thanks once again, and we look forward to seeing you soon at another governing event.